Hello, uh, traders. Chris Cabrera here, SecondSkiesForex.com. Good morning, afternoon, and evening to everyone, wherever you are in the world. How's everybody doing today? Okay, fantastic. So thanks for waiting on that. So welcome to today's webinar. All right, well, enough of that. So welcome to today's webinar. It's good to have everybody here. And today's webinar, being the monthly webinar, is on Forex price action trading. It's really on price action trading as a whole. And so part of what we're going to be talking about in today's webinar is things that you'll actually be, this is kind of like a precursor to the stuff in my book. So right now, I think I mentioned it, I'm kind of doing chapters six and seven at the same time. And so I'm going to be bringing some stuff out that's in my book or will give you hints of what my book is about. There's no way in an hour and a half we're going to cover all the good stuff in my book. There's no way in an hour and a half we're going to cover all the good stuff in an entire chapter I have. And so my book is on trading price action. And <clears throat> I'm, in the book I cover all kinds of tools that I use to trade price action, to read price action, to understand price action. And there's also some quantitative data in there. There's a lot of quantitative data on particular price action patterns, on volatility analytics, on price action behaviors. There's all kinds of things. You know, my program and I are working like hardcore, and we've already built, I've, I just counted it recently. We've built a total of 27 different algorithms. And these are not, these are separate from algorithms that are designed to trade. So I have algorithms that are designed that are for trading purposes in the sense of they execute a strategy. And then I have other algorithms that are designed to give me quantitative data on price action. And so by getting all this data and digesting all this data, they I get to really understand price action from a very different perspective. It's one thing for somebody to say, hey, well, this is 60% accurate, but not back it up with any data. It's a completely different thing to say, hey, I actually have the quantitative data on that particular formation, and it's not 60% accurate. It's actually, you know, 56, or it's 72, or it's 45% accurate with this type of ratio of reward to risk. And so it's very easy just to throw data out there and not back it up with any sort of data. And I'm very excited to bring a lot of this data out because the bottom line is, Find me a book out there on price action. First off, there aren't that many books on price action. Second off, the ones that are out there, I've found them to be, I've only found one to have good information, but it was written so badly that I'd rather bang my head against the curb than read the book. And so, and I, I feel like the author completely fails to actually give you any sort of system whatsoever. They'll tell you, well, this is a really, this is a reasonable entry, or this is a good entry, or this is a, a good scalp, or this is a good buy here. And then you try and digest it and say, okay, well, wh okay, I got your entry, but where's your stop and where's your limit? And they'll never tell you what their stop and the limit is. Or they'll say, hey, this sets up a good buy scalp for a stop here, but they don't even tell you the entry or the target. What good is that? It's useful in giving you some ideas. And yes, Tafik nailed it, Al Brooks. It's good in giving you some ideas about price action, but it doesn't give you anything about how to trade it. You're left to do all the work yourself. And it was the most, it, it's, again, I'd rather, I'd rather bleed out of my eyes than read that book. And so it, it's just, it's just, it's just so awfully written, you know, and then he contradicts himself every 10 paragraphs. So write something and then he writes something two paragraphs later that completely contradicts what he just said. And, you know, so I, it's not that he doesn't know how to trade and it's not that he doesn't understand the markets or price action. It's just his writing style is so bad. And he, again, he never actually gives you a system to work with. He never, he never gives you anything to work with. And so... Part of the reason why I'm writing this book is because I have a perspective on price action, and I feel like I have a slightly different perspective on price action. I approach it differently than most people. I also feel like I'm the only person out there that's talking about quantitative data on price action. Again, 
scan all the price action books out there, find me one of them that can back up any particular system or strategy with quantitative data. Not one. I can't even find a website of anybody that teaches price action and backs it up with quantitative data. And so with that being said, I feel like this is something that needs to be out there. Either the people that have it aren't wanting to release it or they just don't have it. Nobody's been able to, nobody has it. So with that being said, that's what this book is about. And so when I talk about algorithms, there's two types of algorithms. There's algorithms for trading and there's algorithms for processing quantitative data. And so my program and I built 27 of them and they measure approximately 40 different metrics of price action, you know, and just to kind of, go over a list of some of them the max can say i can on any time frame i can plug this algorithm in and i can get 13 different metrics just from one algorithm it can tell me the max consecutive bull bars in a row or the max consecutive bear bars in a row i could find out the max consecutive low for that particular time frame is below the other low i can tell you the max consecutive high will be above the next high which gives me very good information about market being overextended, possible reversals, how much is this like the trend as it, or does it have more of a kind of a reversion type nature? So I can get you information like, what is the max consecutive days that the range of price action will be twice the average? Well, that's very useful to know. That can tell me, hey, this breakout, you know, is way overextended at this point. We've been constantly you know, much larger than the day's range, this thing's going to have to reverse or pull back a little bit. So there's, there's tons of data that we have on price action, quantitative data. And when I'm saying quantitative data, I'm saying statistical data. And so on price action. And some of this is going to be coming out of my book. And I'm going to be giving some portions of that right here in this webinar. So I'm giving you kind of hints of some of the stuff that's going to be in the book. And so the goal of this webinar, at least for the first session, is we're going to go over a common myth in price action that's recently come out and why that doesn't apply and how you have to understand it in context. You can't just apply this rule blindly. I was recently on, the only forum I ever participate on or ever even go to is the forexstreet.net forum. It's the only forum I go to partially because I put articles there, partially because I've been a member of FX Street forever. <laughs> my, is my book free for FX Street members? Good God, no. My, my publisher would kill me if I, I tried to do that. And, you know, to answer that question, why wouldn't you pay for my book? If my book is going to make you a better trader and it's going to give you information that's never been there before, why, why wouldn't you pay for it? Why would you ask for something for free like that? So where can you buy? It'll be released on Amazon. Uh, I'll have it everywhere, but it's not done yet. I'm on chapter six and seven. So, but, so I'm going to spend off, spend the first portion of this talking about a common myth that's come up in price action. And the reason why I'm starting with this is I heard somebody, you know, they were like, Hey, I reversed this pair because such and such person said when this happens, it's a high probability reversal. And so, and I just, I was just kind of, I realized that people read things in books and they take them to be law and they don't really understand them. And so, you know, I, I'm going to spend some time kind of dispelling this myth and then I'm going to break it down from a price action perspective when this would look like a really good setup and when this would not. So we're going to talk about the difference between accumulation and exhaustion. We're going to talk about overextension, sell climaxes, and when you can expect this to uh, continue on in that particular trend. I'm going to show some examples of how the rule, completely, you know, this new touted rule completely failed and examples of when you would really want to apply this rule. And then I'm going to talk about something called Kifu. So this is a price action trading technique that is used in Ichimoku. 
And then after that, I'm going to get into these price action analytics, the volatility analytics for euro dollar, sterling dollar. And then after all that, if we have enough time, I'm going to spend the remaining time of it, either whatever is the most active pair today of the majors, we're going to break it down bar by bar up to the current bar from the London Open from a price action perspective. So that is what we're going to be covering today. And so I'm looking forward to it. All right, so with that being said, let's see, there's a couple questions. Can I address these questions real briefly, and then I want to get into the material. So Joe says, what do you mean by an algorithm? An algorithm is really a mathematical formula or method for, you can use it for analyzing data, for computing a certain data and coming up with an answer. In terms of trading, when I talk about algorithm, there's really two types of algorithmic trading that or algorithms that I use. I use some algorithms for trading, so it's a mathematical formula for trading the markets, and that gets converted into an EA in MT4. So it's a trade, it's an expert advisor that actually produces trades based on an algorithm or a pattern that I n have noticed in the market is a high probability pattern. And so that is one type of algorithmic trading I do. The other type of algorithms I use <clears throat> is algorithms that I basically tell my programmer, here are the rules, here are the mathematical rules for this particular pattern or setup or whatever, and find me the quantitative data in it. Give me the statistics for that particular pattern. What's its frequency? What's its probability of success? Expectancy. What are my targets exactly to the PIP? What are my entries exactly to the PIP? And so forth. And so those are the types of algorithms I'm talking about. So hopefully that answers your question. Okay, Rob Sisson, very few books tell you how to manage a trade properly, and that is the bit that seems to be the hardest. I don't know if about managing a trade properly is the hardest thing. I, I would have to say, actually, for traders, the most difficult thing is probably the, the psychology of trading, dealing with emotions and the mental aspects of it. But... Again, you're right, very few books will tell you entry, stop, limit. Just that alone is hard to get from a book. And then on top of it, to get quantitative data to say, hey, this exact entry, stop and limit on this exact price action formation, here's the data over the last five years, how it performed. And, you know, here's what you can expect with this type of target or a two times target or a three times target or this type of entry to the T. You won't find it. And so that's what this is about. That's what my book is designed to do. So, yeah. Axel says, yeah, the book is hard to comprehend if you're new to price action. I'm not new to price action. And it's not a question. Of, and, it, and I consider myself to be a reasonably intelligent guy. I was a Golden Key National Honor student. I had dual degrees in neuroscience and philosophy. I was a research assistant. You know, I consider myself to be a reasonable. I self-taught myself how to trade currencies. I consider it with no degree, not even one single business class or economics or finance class. I consider myself to be an intelligent guy, and I consider myself to be someone who understands price action. It's not a question of comprehending the info. It's, it's how the book is written so poorly and how, again, he'll give you an entry, but he never tells you to stop and limit, which is completely useless. Okay, great. Now I have an entry. I have no idea where I should be setting my stop and limit and if that's going to be a viable target or not. So how is that useful to me? It just gives me some little kudo, but it doesn't teach me how to trade price action. So that's my problem with the book. And it's just incredibly inconsistent and incredibly overcomplicated. I believe in the philosophy that if somebody really understands something, they'll be able to explain it simply. That's how you know when you really understand something, when you can explain it simply. If you can't explain it simply, then you don't fully understand it in your mind. There's, there's confusion, there's too much detail, there's too much, uh, you know, whatever it is. But you know you fully understood something when you can explain it in simple rules. This was Einstein's big thing, too. So that's my thoughts on that. Ali says, Chris, by trading price action and reading the tape, are they both the same thing? They're not. They're not. Reading the tape is reading the order flow or in the Forex market, it would be level two quotes and reading the buy and sell orders and the volume of buy and sell orders at particular prices. So that would be reading the tape. 
the real definition of reading the tape was reading the orders as they're coming through, reading the prices was reading the particular orders as they're coming through. But we don't have access to that data in the Forex market. So the closest you can get to that is level two quotes and learning how to read level two quotes, which is not that difficult, but there's very little info about that. Maybe someday I'll write a book about that. So, I mean, I have, I have level two quotes, and if I'm making an intraday trade, I'm very concerned about whether the buy and sell volume is in alignment with my trade at that particular time. Maybe if I'm trading a breakout, maybe I'm trading before the breakout, well, a lot of the volume data in level two quotes are very informative to me, whether that's going to be a high probability breakout or the orders just aren't there to support that. So they're very different. Trading price action doesn't have to be an equal read in the tape. You don't have to read the tape to trade price action. Trading price action, price action is simply prices movement over time on any time frame. So it could be a one tick move on a one tick chart. It could be a one pip move on a daily chart. It doesn't matter, but price action is how price has unfolded over time in the past and how it's doing it in real time. And your ability to read that by understanding the order flow behind it, to me, that's reading and trading price action. Some people say trading price action Oh, well, I got this pattern, this pattern, this pattern, this pattern. I trade that. So I'm a price action trader. I don't use any indicators, and I trade those price action patterns. To me, that's that's like half the game. That's that's that is not that's trading without understanding why the market is doing what it's doing. Patterns can happen. Very good patterns can happen, and completely fail. And if you don't learn to read the price action behind it, that could be the difference between hey, this thing's going to fail or it's going to be a high probability setup. A pattern by itself, trading patterns by themselves is passive trading. Understanding the order flow behind that leading up to that move and understanding what kind of order flow would have created that price action, that's learning to read price action and trading in an empowered fashion. Very, very different. Okay. Um... Okay, so I think I've answered the what is quantitative data. Jay says, are you going to sell them eventually? Well, some of the information will be in my book. Some of it will be in this class. Some of it I will dispense in future articles for free. Some of it I will dispense in future webinars, and some of it will go into my course. So it will, it will go in many different directions. So the answer is yes and no. Um, Okay, let's see if there's any more legitimate questions to this. Uh, a, Al says, do you have any plans to sell particular indicators that you're producing? No. And the reason, the reason why is if I start selling indicators, I become a technology provider. And I don't want to be a technology provider. You know, if I start providing indicators, let's say I sell 10,000 of them. Well, if one day the, the algorithms or whatever the indicators fail, then I'm now spending most of my time managing the technology and doing tech support. And that's not my vision. That's not what I want to do. You know, I want to trade, and I want to teach people how to trade, and that's it. That's all I want to do in terms of the Forex market. Well, and I want to trade, teach people how to trade, and I want to share a different perspective for trading price action in Ichimoku. That's what I want to do. I don't want to manage technology. And so that's my thoughts on that. All right. Do I use an independent programmer? Yes, I have two programmers that I work with. Uh, let's see. Okay, last few questions. Gabriel says, would you say that trading price action is trading the psychology of the market? I would say that's part of it, but... Sometimes pre price action is just the result of, hey, this is a really good level. I got my pattern and I want to buy. And so I wouldn't say it's all psychology. I would say sometimes the psychology is embedded in the market. But at the same time, you're going to see the psychology more often than not when it comes to relationship to risk, not risk, when it comes to trends being overextended, particularly bull trends. You're going to see it when, you know, in more long-term moves. But sometimes people just buy just to buy. So 
hopefully answers your question. Joe says, how can you determine the order flow? Is it not something you can see in the historical price pattern? You can, you can intimate the order flow. You'll never know the exact order flow that formed a particular candle. But you can intimate the order flow if you have enough experience reading price action, if you have enough understanding of how the market works. So if you really understand what kind of order flow creates price action, then you'll be able to start to really unfold the order flow behind particular price action. And so over time, you'll get good enough at really understanding this. But you'll never know the exact order flow. There are some basic principles that will give you some idea of that, and also level two quotes will kind of give you an insight into that. But you'll never know the exact combination of order flow that creates the exact candle because I could give you 10 engulfing patterns that look virtually identical to the pip and I, I can pretty much guarantee that the type of transactions which created that particular pattern 10 times over will never be purely identical there's just no way there's no way it could be in one case, the concentration of small group of players pushing in massive amounts of money, or it can be the concentration of lots of players executing lots of transactions in that to create that particular formula. So there's many different types of combinations that you can create that. So hopefully that, that answers your question. Okay, Joe has another question. Do you make more than one million yourself? I hope it's not too impolite. You know, it, it is pretty, I wouldn't say it's impolite. It's pretty audacious to ask such a question. You know, I don't even know you. And you're asking me in a public forum my personal finances. And, you know, to me, how much I'm worth and my wealth is, is my personal business. You know, especially around tax time right now when I just filed my taxes, I wouldn't necessarily consider it a great idea to be saying, yes, this is how much I make. I, I You know, and so if you were somebody I knew and a friend and somebody I had a relationship with, then I would feel very comfortable about that. But announcing my wealth puts me in a very vulnerable position, not just with the IRS, which is the last group of people I want to put myself in a vulnerable position with, but it leaves me open to all kinds of, you know, situations. You know, I could be kidnapped for money. I could, you know, be robbed. I could all, so to me, retail clients, you guys are such an interesting bunch of people. And one day I'll get into this. You know, you guys want me to be the wealthiest person on the planet. You want me to brag about it, but yet you want me to be humble about it. You know, you want me to, you know, be, you know, someone who talks about, yes, I'm worth this much, this much, and this much, and yet, that would be very insensitive to the whole 1%, 99% occupation Wall Street. You know, there's a lot of problems going on with wealth in this world. And you want me to brag about it and yet be non, you want me to be humble about it at the same time. Oh, he's bragging about his wealth. So, anyways. Yeah, I, sorry for going off on that, but I just, I get that question a lot. And it's just, I, I'm really amazed that people ask that question. Okay, so last question, and then I want to get on to it. Is this right that 10 out of 10 traders, out of 10 traders, 9 fail in this business? It's actually not correct. If you look at the most recent study that was published just out of the U.S. brokers, between 20, on the low end, 27 to 28% of all clients were profitable, and on the high end, 40%. And so... You know, it, some brokers had greater profitability, some had less. And so it tends to be about 3 in 10 up to about 4 or 5 in 10 are profitable. And that's on the retail side. So it's so that's just completely not true. So hopefully that answers your question. All right, with that being said, I spent a lot of time 
going over things that I probably shouldn't have been going over. And so we're going to dive straight into this. From here on out, if you guys have questions, let's direct them completely towards the topic. So questions are fine. Just let's keep it focused on the topic and what we're going to be talking about in this moment. All right, great. So one price action rule that's kind of come out, it, it kind of became popular and kind of for a bad reason was, you know, and I was seeing it on this for, on the forexstreet.net, the person said, when I see 10 candles in a row of the same color, bull or bear, it often means a high probability reversal because this person in his book said that. And I realized that, wow, that's a big misunderstanding about it. It is true that it's not often that you'll see 10 candles in a row, bull or bear. And it's not uncommon. In fact, on the one hour time frame, for example, on the sterling dollar, the max consecutive bull candles historically that you'll ever see in a row has been eight over the last five years. The max consecutive bear candles in a row on a one hour time frame is 10. And so that's on the one hour time frame. It varies depending upon what time frame you're working with, one minute, five minute, daily, hour. But the range for most of the majors tends to be between six and 15. So if this person's thinking, wow, when I see 10 candles in a row, it's all bull, this means a high probability reversal, they could be getting crushed. It could be one of those situations where it's 15 for that particular pair. So they're going to re look for a reversal, they're going to reverse it, and then they're going to get crushed. I understand the logic of the thinking. If there's a lot of candles in a row, the market's going to probably have to unwind some of that. And I understand that thinking, but it quantitatively just doesn't play itself out. And I want to give a great example of, you know, here's an example right in front of you. Your Australian dollar. It finds a bottom here, and we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten candles in a row to the T. Does the market reverse? No, it actually creates a bull continuation pattern and then climbs higher. So here they're shorting it, looking to get a nice two-to-one move out of it, and they get stopped out because they're just following some rule blindly that, oh, well, when it's 10 candles in a row, it's a high probability reversal. I could show you a dozen examples in the next five minutes that will completely blow this out of the water. You don't want to follow a rule blindly just because it's in a book. This is why we learn to read and trade price action as it is. Because the bottom line is when you learn to read it, you're not going to be just following some blind rule. You're going to hey, in real time, the market's communicating something to me completely different. And we're going to start to unfold this as to the difference between exhaustion, continuation, accumulation on particular trends. And this can be useful to us whether we want to get into the trend, whether we want to reverse the trend, or we want to step aside. So that is what we're going to be getting into for this first uh, small section here. <clears throat> now, when would the 10, you know, when would that rule be something very useful? Okay, I've seen 10 candles, 11 candles, 12 candles. From a price action perspective, a trend is going to continue until you see A, a major counter trend reversal signal, or B, something accompanying that called exhaustion or a climax. What does exhaustion look like on a particular move? I'm going to show you an example on Euro Aussie. I'm going to show you an example on the Dow, its most recent pullback. I'm going to show you an example on gold. And so I'm going to show you what exhaustion looks like. Exhaustion is where in the last portion of the move, and most ideally in the last candle of a particular uptrend or downtrend, that the candle is incredibly large. An ideal situation would be you have 10 candles in the row, and it starts off small, and then the candles get bigger, and then the last candle or the last two or three candles gets big, bigger, and biggest. Why is that from an order flow perspective? It's a combination of things. One, the people who generally start trends are generally not retail traders. It's, we compromise as a, as a whole 10% of the market, and that's across all the pairs we, we trade. The people who start trends are called the initiators. 
And generally when they start it, it's either a massive explosion right off the beginning or it's what is called accumulation. And I'm going to break all these different scenarios down. But they're the first people to get into a trade. They take the most risk because, you know, they're starting a new move. There, there isn't a lot of people jumping in at the same time saying, hey, we've seen that there's a trend in place, so we're going to go long too. No, there is no trend. And they're changing the direction of the market and starting a new trend. So they take on a massive amount of risk. But there tends to be in the accumulation or beginning phases of a trend the least amount of players in the market. And so at that point in time, there's not many players. Now, as the trend starts to progress, it's generally going to probably clear a support or resistance level. It's going to show more consistency. It shows stability above or below the 20 EMA, depending upon the direction. And as the trend starts to build, then other people catch whiff of it. You know, it, and it goes from the higher level players to the lower level players, traditionally. So what happens is, is that now the the next level of advanced traders comes in. This could be the prop data traders, the desk traders, the private desk traders. It could be, you know, some bank traders that missed the initial move. It could be some hedge funds. It could be all kinds of people. But they tend to be more experienced players. Your more experienced retail traders that are consistently profitable month in, month out, they tend to catch these as well. They can either catch the beginning if they're really skillful or they catch the next move of it after the move has been confirmed. Now, what happens is, is that as the trend progresses in its cycle, more traders start to get aware of it, and they say, wait a minute, this trend's definitely in play. I'm going to get involved in it. And so what happens? So then more traders start to pile in. So you have more players in the market and more transactions. You have more, it increases volume. All of this tends to create larger and larger candles. If you think about it, if you have three, five, or eight candles in a row, and the candles go from smallest to biggest, how does that happen? It happens from an increase in money coming in the direction of that particular move, and it comes from an increase of players coming into the market. Trends and moves, whether it's an intraday move on a five-minute time frame or a one-minute time frame or an hour or daily or whatever time frame, the trend on that particular time frame tends to end when the market creates what is called an exhaustion or climax, when you have the most amount of players in the market and you have the most amount of people pushing in one direction. That's when moves tend to end, particularly these types of trends. And what that will generally create is, and I'll give you another example. Let me see if you see the, sorry about that, I did that. Okay, so do you see the chart here on gold? Yes, no? Not sure if you do. Okay, great. What do you see in the beginning? You see a bunch of little candles. This, when you see a bunch of little candles and they're all bull or all bear, it generally tends to mean accumulation. There's not a lot of players that are willing to get in this trend at this point, so we're not seeing big candles but there's slow, steady, consistent buying. Beginning of accumulation moves tend to be slow, small candles that are several candles of the same color. You know, 70 to 80% of the candles tend to be one color. So this will be an accumulation right here. This is accumulation. And if you look, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, if that person just blindly followed the 10 candle rule, they would have gotten crushed again. And so this is accumulation. When you see that, maybe you get a double bottom and then you kind of see a higher low with several small candles slowly building up. That's accumulation to a new run up. And so that's not the time to be saying, okay, this is 10 candles. We've hit our max. We're going to reverse it here. No, this is when the market is most likely going to start a very big move. What happens in the second leg of the move? You notice how the candles start getting bigger? That's because more players are getting into the market. Everybody's saying, okay, this trend is definitely in play. Maybe we've taken out a resistance level here, a little breakout pullback. New players get in, and boom, they push it up here. 
and they start to really get aggressive on this here. So now more players are in the market. Generally, when a move is exhausted, you'll see a very large candle at the top. It should be one of the largest in the entire series, if not the largest. And ideally, the candles leading up to it go from small to big. So whatever size they are, they increase in size as they're coming up to the top. Generally, when you see that, then the market is more than likely going to reverse. The market is exhausted. It's kind of done a last push, and that's it. Why is this? Markets can only sustain very heavy buying or selling for so long. Consistent buying like this is easily sustainable because it's not over imbalanced. But when you have very large imbalances like this, that is only sustainable for so long. It's kind of like a cheetah in, you know, the Serengeti Desert. It's the fastest land animal, but only for a short period of time. It's good at sprinting, but it doesn't have endurance. And so it exhausts an immense amount of energy, but it can only sustain that for so long. Trends work exactly the same. If it doesn't burn too hot, then it can sustain it for a longer period of time. But once it starts to really overheat, that's when you have a high probability of a reversal. Case in point, this is part of how I was able to spot, and look what happens here. You can see candle large, 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 very large at the end. Gold has never seen these highs since then. Case in point, take a look at the Dow. Everybody was saying, how did you recognize the top in the Dow? Take a look at the difference in the move. Do you see how it's just kind of steady, consistent buying? Which to me was interesting because it was happening on low volume. But the candles aren't overextending themselves. They're not burning too hot. What do you see in the last leg here? Small leading up to large. And go figure, the largest candle at the end of the move was at the top. This generally tends to mean exhaustion. And so at that point, I'm then looking for a reversal trigger, maybe a lower high or a failed to make a new high, and then I'm looking to reverse it at that point. In this situation, if you start to see five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten candles in a row, then that would be the time period that you start looking for reversal. Not when you see this little consistent steady candles like that. That would not be the time to do that. So... Does that make sense in terms of the 10 candle rule, when we want to apply it, when we don't want to apply it? Okay. Very critical. It's, it's so critical because, yeah, it's, I, I was just amazed that this person just said, okay, I saw 10 candles, so I'm looking at and the person in the book said it's a high probability reversal, so I'm going to short it. Well, there are going to be times where that's totally true and times when it's not even close to true. And so it's important that we learn how to read the price action that would create such a thing. Now, a couple questions regarding this, and let's get into it. So Philip J says, do outsiders start trends? If you're talking about retail traders, retail traders are – never going to start a trend. Even you got to remember we're 10% of the market and that's across all the pairs we trade. If we all concentrated on the euro dollar in one moment and we all hit the button at the same time, maybe we could at that point. But generally not. We don't start trends institution we don't move the market institutions move the market, the high level players move the market. So, if you're saying outsiders when you're talking about retailers, no. So, and it depends. Some institutional traders are short-term, some are medium-term, some are long-term. You know, FX Concepts, the largest currency fund on the planet, over $25 billion, they tend to be more long-term. They do have some intraday strategies, but they tend to hold long port trades for long periods of time, which either means they're going to do great on a year or they're going to get crushed. Okay, so hopefully that answers your question. Yana says, can we recognize major self like we have intermediate and gold and silver? They should be looking for a weakness in the bullish to then turn it bearish. Maybe you could elaborate on this in the last session. I'm not sure I totally understand your question, Yanis, but in regards to this, 
I'm generally look, you know, and it was pretty easy for me to spot the reversal in Dow. It was pretty easy for me to spot the, you know, reversal in a lot of different instruments because it's usually accompanying. The first thing it'll be accompanied by is exhaustion. More often than not, it's exhaustion. The second thing it tends to be accompanied by is a reversal pattern accompanied or with that particular exhaustion. More often than not, an exhaustion will tend to be followed by a very strong reversal pattern. It's almost, it's almost inevitable because what happens is you're going to have this massive influx of transactions and then the institutional players that are, realize this is the end, they're going to exit out of the market and that's going to create a huge vacuum in the market in the sense of, oh shit, a lot of big players just sold off, so the market's going to tank very rapidly. That's going to trigger some stops for the people that just got long on the trend, or maybe were short-term just got in it. They're going to get triggered stops. So then all those orders are going to trigger now the market further reason to sell off. People are going to recognize it. There's going to be a motion behind it. Further thing, the market's going to sell off even further, and that's going to tend to create a reversal trigger. It could be a pin bar. It could be a engulfing bar. It could be a piercing pattern. It could be, it tends not to be an evening star or morning star because those take three candles. It tends to be a two bar or one bar reversal. It could be a Janus reversal bar. What is a Janus reversal bar? You'll have to wait to my book. I've invented a new reversal formation. So it could be any one of those. And so, but it tends to be a two bar or one bar, not a three bar. So Exhaustion very rarely, exhaustion reversals very rarely are three bar patterns. They just take too long. It's usually the exhaustion bar and another bar, or the exhaustion bar itself is a one bar reversal pattern. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, oh yeah, and some other things that I tend to look for when I see that is, okay, the first thing I want to see is exhaustion. The second thing I want to see is a reversal pattern. And the third thing, I this is the most ideal, Exhaustion reversal pattern plus, you know, failed low or high or low or low depending upon the trend. If I see all those, it's kind of like to me that's, that's you know, that's kind of an all-in type thing. I, that's when I got all the pieces are aligned for a high probability reversal. So hopefully that kind of illuminates that a little bit further. Trying Trader says, at what point do you stop buying in a trend? If I see exhaustion, I'm going to stop buying. If I see a very large reversal candle, then I'm going to stop buying at that point. Because if the bulls were in, in control and they all of a sudden, I mean, case I'm zoomed back here a little bit. Bulls are clearly in control, very strong buying, immense buying here we start to get some rejections here, and then we get this little bar right here. Well, wait a minute. The bulls have been in control four, five, six, seven out of the last nine days in a row. If they and, they and they just made a new high on this candle right here. Then on this candle, they make another high, and then it, you know, we create an engulfing pattern. Wait a minute. Where were all the bulls? What happened? Why did they not continue to hold the new highs? We even had a series of lower highs. What happened to all of them? So... When you see things like that, that's when it's time to stop buying. Until you see those signs, generally you want to keep buying the particular trend. Now, does that mean we want to buy on breaks? Not necessarily. Sometimes you want to buy on pullbacks. Sometimes in a trend you buy breaks. Sometimes you buy pullbacks. So hopefully that answers your question there. Yes, Forex Trader PT, this is recorded, so you'll see you later. Ali says, Chris, do you trade all five days a week and in which session you prefer? Depends on each week. You know, some weeks, lower volatility. I trade less. Some weeks, I trade more volatility. I actually stopped trading on Wednesday this week because I've made my gains for the week. I've made about 14% gains in this week. And to me, you know, that's, that's a good week. I'm done. There's a couple other reasons why I stopped trading. I saw some price action clues that told me the market could get pretty choppy. I, I saw it on Tuesday that the market could get pretty choppy, so I stopped trading the rest of the week. Okay. Dow seems to have small, have lots of small bodies with longer wicks, lots of spinning top. Isn't this hard to read or is this normal for the Dow? In regards to that, 
I think you're talking about this one right here. That's why you can't take a pattern based on itself. You know, you don't just trade a spinning top just because it's a spinning top. You have to take it in the context of things. The bottom line is this thing was sustained above the 20 MA for a long period of time. Only until I see a break below it will I say, okay, now I'm really worried about my long, my, my long position. You know, so, or I've failed to make new highs and then I made new lows, you know. So until you see a change in the major structure, there's no point. And a trend will continue until somebody comes in and says, we're more powerful than you. Or we're done buying this thing up. A trend will continue as long as it wants to. Currency markets have a, have a, have a knack for overextending for going much farther than they should. And that's partially because it's got so much, there's so much liquidity and volume in it. And there's so many different players all over the world. So until I see a major structural change, major reversal change, major exhaustion or anything like that, I'm going to keep buying. Forex Trader PT, do you use FIBOs to determine the up of an uptrend or down downtrend? I do not. I do not, because markets can often overextend Fibonacci Fibonacci projections. So, how much do I risk per trade? Depends. But this week I, I got a little aggressive because I, I just I had a slight intuition that I was gonna get a couple big winners this week, and so I risked three percent. And across three trades, I ended up with fourteen percent gain. So, it just depends. Sometimes half a percent, sometimes up to 3%, 2%, 1%, just a bit. Okay, last question, then I want to get into, I want to go back to the Euro Aussie one. In fact, let me go back to that. I want to talk about this one and why, you know, we didn't want to be reversing here, but we wanted to be reversing here. It should be obvious, but we'll get back into it. So Al says, so if you get accumulation on a shorter time frame, Sterling dollar is doing that at the moment of five minute chart. If it then accumulates into larger bars at a price that looks like a meaningful resistance to the left on the same chart, does that increase the odds of reversals? Let me see. If you get accumulation on a short time, accumulation doesn't increase the odds of a reversal. Exhaustion does. Accumulation is usually the beginning part of a trend. And so, again, you know, in this beginning move here, we see four candles that are small, partially because the bears were in control. Let me zoom back a little bit. The bears were in control here. You know, they sold off the 20 MA flag pattern right here. Boom, they sold it. One, two, three, four, five candles in a row. Now we get a piercing line over here, but it's rejected to the upside, communicating there are still some sellers present in the market. But then look what happens. It opens. It doesn't break the low or even match the lows of this. It gets bought up higher. And it keeps doing this for four candles, except here, doji candle, it, telling us, okay, there's both players right here on both sides of the market, maybe a rejection here. But this is an accumulation phase. So there's still some sellers in the market, and the buyers are slowly accumulating it here. Once they kind of get past this here, that's when the market really takes off. So that's when the buyers say, okay, we've now managed to wrestle control of this. We're getting long. So accumulation when you see general accumulation, it generally doesn't mean that it's going to reverse. Accumulation generally doesn't, that's not the time to be looking for a massive reversal. I tend to be looking for exhaustion or overextension or a climax bar. So hopefully that answers your question. Okay. All right, great. So let's, let's get into this one here. Now, looking back at this one, can you see the difference here we had 10 bars, but we didn't see a massive reversal pattern here, did we? We didn't see strong sellers just coming in counter trend immediately and saying, okay, bam, no, we're, we're right here and we're going to stop you in your tracks and we're going to push you back in one big push, in one candle. We didn't see that. We didn't see that. We also didn't see candles going from small to big. We saw big right here, which means they either took up some stops, the sellers gave up, or new players came in and said, okay, we believe this is a, a full-on reversal. We're going to get in. They pushed it. So there's a big push in the middle. But then look what happens the last two candles. It didn't go from big, small, smaller. It went from big, medium, medium. So the speed of the buying and selling 
remains stable going into the end. If it was unstable, it would either be small, big, bigger, or it would be big, small, smaller. But we didn't see any speed change over these last two candles here. Usually when the market reverses, there is a change in the speed of the buying and selling. And this is something I actually talk about in my book. You usually see a massive acceleration or massive deceleration. Acceleration usually means exhaustion or there's a bunch of players coming in the market or massive deceleration. The buyers are in control, but they recognize, shoot, we're coming into a massive resistance level here. Maybe there's a huge option barrier. Maybe it's a round number, whatever. And so they start pulling back positions in advance of the stop sign ahead. So <clears throat> does that make sense? that there should be a speed change in the buying or selling going into reversal? Yes, no? It's kind of a, I know we're starting to get some more theoretical concepts here, but does that make sense? Okay, great. When I see no speed change, then to me that generally means continuation. So I didn't really see a speed change here. I just saw the same amount of buying on this candle as it was on this one. And if anything, the bulls weren't really taking any profits because there's very little wick to the top side. So what happens? The market then goes sideways, and my friend on the forum is shorting this because he says, wow, I saw 10 candles. This thing has a high probability reversal because the guy in the book told me. And guess what? They're looking for a two-to-one target, and then they get crushed because there was no exhaustion. There was, you know, and it could have even hit a resistance level doesn't matter. It went sideways, consolidated. It even created a pin bar over here, but we had no exhaustion or anything like that. And what happens? The next candle is saying, guess what? This pin bar is not going to work out. And boom, it breaks through. Now, why does this one work that much more? Because it's the largest candle. We see a speed change and we get a very strong counter trend signal on the next bar. So to me, okay, now I'm looking for a reversal. I see this candle, very, very different. Does that, mean, does that make sense why this one was a completely different and then we want to be looking for it? Yes, no? I mean, come on. We finally break through this resistance level. We get very strong buying on this candle. The next candle barely makes a new high and then just sells off and depletes, what, 70% of the gains in this candle? Where did all the buyers go that were right here? Where did they go? So, to me, now the move is overextended. And then I want to start looking for a reversal, maybe back to the 20 EMA. It actually goes a little bit further than that. It goes way, it retraces all the gains, pretty much. Almost all of them. So, I've spent a lot of time kind of unfolding this particular rule. You know, when a trend is more than likely going to reverse from a price action perspective and when it's likely to continue. Do you all feel pretty complete on that in terms of, you know, the consecutive bars, exhaustion, not exhaustion, accumulation? Yes, no? All right, great. I want to show you one more example of this. Let me delete the other chart here. So here we're looking at sterling dollar, and this is a really good example of exhaustion and accumulation. Okay. So we have a range going into this gray line here is the London Open. Go figure, we have a range on sterling dollar. It's not that active during Tokyo. Then right before London Open, Europeans come in. They start selling it pretty aggressively, decently. They start selling it, but we keep finding buyers here. We find some buyers here. We find some buyers here with a rejection. We finally kind of get a line in the sand. And then we start to see, let's zoom in a little bit. Oh, go figure, accumulation buying. Again, same thing, accumulation buying. Now what happens? The mark comes back to the kind of range high from prior to London Open. It rejects off of it, and we get some sellers in here, but this is not after exhaustion now, is it? This is after steady accumulative buying. We had a piercing line reversal pattern. It produces low, higher lows, 
and then it goes on one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven candles in a row. But nothing was really exhaustive here. Did we see any candles that were exorbitantly large? Not at all. So then what happens is, okay, we get some sellers in here, and then the buyers say, great, you've just given us an opportunity to buy this lower. They buy it, and we zoom in. They buy it, it goes literally one pip lower. Huge surge in buying. This is where new players come into the market. This is where the current buyers that helped accumulate this feel like, okay, we've obviously taken control of the market. So the new players and the current players, the initiators, they come in, they take out the stops, and now they're really in control. Now the market's probably going to go for a big move. And so in the same amount of candles, actually one candle less, it covers almost twice the distance. It goes from 20, 59.20 to 59.90, 70 pips. And here over seven candles, it only goes 30 pips. So once you see this big candle, it's kind of like, okay, now we're off to the races. And look what happened. Boom. Now, take a look at how this move is different. Do you see how now we're getting into exhaustion here? This is the kind of sprint that cannot be maintained forever. It's just, it's so strong, it's so hot that it's going to eventually overheat. So there's no way this can be maintained. Look at what happens on this last candle. It's the second largest candle in this entire move. It opens. Buyers are there from the open. They push it right into the close. They take very few profits at the end there, so they're still present in the market. But it's definitely exhaustive to some degree. It's, it's much more intense. And wait a minute. What happened to all these buyers that have been pushing this up for 70 pips? They now come in, and another bar takes out about 40% of the gains. Shoot, maybe this thing is, okay, maybe it's overheating at this point. And what does it do? It pulls back to the 20 MA. Eventually it continues on. But if you were long here, and then you saw all this consolidation, I'm pretty sure you would exit the market at this point. One, you've just reversed 20 of your 70 pip gain, so you've just lost 33% of your paper profits. Two, it's, you've now been in the market three times as long over this period as you were for these six candles. So what's the point of staying in this thing? Can everybody see the difference, though? Accumulation, now the market's really in it. Exhaustion, yes, no. We also see failed low or high here. Now I have an entry trigger to get in the market. Can everybody see that? I have exhaustion, I have failed lower highs, and I have a reversal trigger right here. This and this right here is my reversal trigger. Now I have a play into the market. Does everybody see that? Okay, great. Okay, I just want to answer the last few questions, and then I want to start getting into some of the quantitative data, because we only have about 30 minutes left for this section here. Rob says, your primary bars are one hour and four hour. When did I drop to the five minute? I didn't change or anything. I'm just kind of showing this as an example. You're right. My primary bars are one hour and four hour. When I trade intraday, three and five minutes are my favorites. But I'm doing a lot less intraday trading right now because I, I, I don't have that much time, you know, with the writing of the book. I need to be concentrating on writing my books. I need to be incredibly efficient with my trading. And, yeah, I just don't have the time to, to be doing that. So, but this is just to show the example. You know, I've showed it on the daily, I've showed it on the four hour, I've showed it on the one hour. Okay. Boyke says, and distribution. Yeah, I would probably lean towards this as more of a redistribution at this point, but also exhaustion. Exhaustion that either, exhaustion tends to lead to very strong reversal or at least a redistribution before continuing the trend. And if it's going to lead to redistribution, I guarantee that the players that are already long are not going to be waiting through this redistribution phase because they're not in control of the market. They, they, if you realize you were in control and all of a sudden you've lost control, you're either going to want to get into, you're either going to see a reestablishment of control or a, yeah, you're going to want to see reestablishing control, otherwise you're just going to say, okay, I'm done. So hopefully that answers your question. Drydose says, each candle represents the new positions in the time of the candle. 
I kind of, can you rephrase your question? I think I get it, but yeah, if you could restate that, would be great. Rob Smith says, I've read a lot of things saying you only get accumulation on down bars. That's, yeah, it's completely ridiculous. Accumulation is not tied to a direction. It's tied to a, it's tied to the particular type of order flow. And so accumulation is an accumulation of orders in the direction of a new trend that's building, basically. So it could be on the buy side. It could be on the sell side. So hopefully that answers your question. Okay, let's see here. Michael says, your reversal trigger is a dueling sword. Yes, and dueling sword, who's who's kind of, who's the first, per not the first person, I can't really say the first person, but who is one of the first people to ever really talk about the dueling sword pattern? Anyway, no? CC, Chris Capri, yeah. You'll see it on my website if you type in dueling sword. I'm not going to claim credit for it, but I was one of the first persons to be talking about it. But it doesn't really matter. I don't give a crap about that. Okay, so what you're saying, Michael, says your reversal trigger is a dueling sword, but I guess first one is bearish and a hanging man. Makes sense, please. Okay, so here's the thing about this. Remember, what are the things I'm looking for when I want to see if a trend is ending from a price action perspective? I should see either a climax, one bar climax, I should see exhaustion in the sense of the bars are really large at the end, disproportionately larger than usual. And then that's the first thing. So the exhaustion, climax, disproportionately large bars, that's the first thing I want to see. The second thing I'm looking for is a strong counter trend reversal signal. And generally these will come in the form, most often than not, they'll come in the form of a two bar pattern. So you have the strong climax or exhaustion bar, and then you have the counter trend reversal bar. And that about face in the movement of the price is either a combination of all the bulls in this case kind of just said, okay, this thing is way overextended, so we're exiting out in mass, or they ran into a counter trend force that was incredibly strong to stop this upward movement and push it back that sharply. So these types of exhaustion climaxes tend to become most, you'll see them most often in the form of two bar reversals. Every now and then they can be represented by a one bar reversal, particularly a pin bar of sorts, but more often than not, they're going to be a two bar reversal. Now, so that's the second thing that I like to see in that particular move. The third thing, which would kind of be the coup de grace, is a lower high or a failed new high. So I tried to make a new high and price just couldn't do it. You know, I tried to and it completely failed. So pin bar pattern, but the pin bar is less effective as a pin bar because a pin bar is most effective when the tail sticks out because that creates the trap. So this is more of just a rejection type bar. Dueling swords, my preference is that the dueling sword is the A bar is the, the prior high and the B bar makes the new high. So, you know, what happens here, we do get some selling there are still some buyers that are either in denial or they're still willing to try and take a second stab at it. But when the market fails at the same level, that tells you at this point, the sellers have legitimized themselves as saying, hey, here is our line in the sand, and they push it back. So this failed new high, that's kind of like the final coup de grace. I should be shorting at that point. So you can either be shorting here in anticipation of it, or you can wait for a pullback into that with a very tight stop above, and then you start looking for a pullback to the 20 MA minimum two to one target. But those are the three things that you want in place. So does that make sense, Michael there? Yes, no? Hopefully it does. All right, great. So let's see, last few questions here and then I wanna get into some of the quantity data. Okay. Jose says, I also see a classic flag pattern on the five-minute. Do you recognize that pattern as legit? 
Yeah, flag patterns are useful. It depends on how the flag pattern and where it happens. If, if for imagine this is the range of the pair for that day, but then price settles back into the middle and then creates a flag, that to me is a, that's not the flag pattern that represents continuation because on a higher time frame, that's just going to look like a doji and it's going to have to fight through all this resistance here and the rejection on the higher time frame here. So it's not a continuation in any way. Same thing to the downside. There's going to be players who are going to be looking to buy it here and sell it here. So on a higher time frame, a four hour daily chart or whatever, it's going to look like a doji and that's, that's not a continuation pattern. Flag patterns are most interesting when they're at the top or the bottom of the range for that particular day or that particular higher time frame. I could have the flag on a five minute time frame and it's totally legit. A flag pattern on a five minute, if it's a flag pattern for that particular day, it could be on the five minute, a one minute, a four hour. It could be on a five minute and a 30 minute or a one hour. So it just depends on how long it plays itself out. Is it useful? Yes, but if it happens after a series of exhaustion, then it's either redistribution or it's going to be leading up to a reversal of sorts. And so it just depends on what are the factors that present themselves at that time. But flag patterns are interesting to me depending upon the context. So hopefully answers your question. Al says, just to clarify my message, Chris, I need to practice speed typing. I saw the sterling dollar now in a five-minute chart had been accumulating with small candles. Not all were up candles, though, so technically not 100% correct. And it peaked at 160.70, resistance area to the left of the chart. The last two candles as price hit 60.70 were two fairly large blue candles. Now price has started dropping, as I figured, had an inside bar reversal at the peak, which proves what you were saying by way of live example. Cool. Okay, great. So very good. Glad we were able to clarify that. Okay, last question, and then I want to move into the data. Michael says, really important and useful explanation of tops and bottoms. I guess divergence would be the cherry on the cake. I don't need divergence to trade these types of tops and bottoms. So, you know, I don't need an indicator divergence to indicate that. I can just trade the pure price action as is to communicate that. If you get really good at reading the price action, particularly when a move is exhausted, when a move is overextended, when it's climaxed, you know, what are the key reversal patterns? And when I'm talking key reversal patterns, I'm talking one, two, and three bar patterns. You know, generally four bar patterns, they're a lot less infrequent because they have that many more moving parts to them. You know, and so you have four candles now, it exponentially gets that many more variables to it. So generally good reversal patterns are usually one, two, and three bar patterns. Those are your going to be your most common reversal patterns. So if you can spot all that, usually that's all you really need. Ganser says, when a pin bar trap is being formed on the four-hour chart, how long normally does price stay in the support resistance zone before it starts failing? Depends on the type of pin bar trap we're talking now. So there are many different variations of that. Your question is on the four-hour chart, it could be it could be one of two things. The pin bar trap could be the final signal that's saying, okay, now we're going to reverse. Like, for example, let's say we have, and I don't have a recent example of this, but let's just say, oh, let me see if I can even find one on a four-hour. Yeah, I can't find right now because I don't have one in recent memory. But let's just say we have a consolidation here, and this is a four-hour chart. And then this bar is like a pin bar trap of sorts right over here. Let's just, you know, use your imagination for a second. The pin bar trap, depending upon how, you know, strong the wick is, is it a bull or bear body, you know, depending upon who's control of that, it could be, okay, now, hey, this is, this is the failure of the market to continue. So the market is saying, hey, this is a failed breakout, and it could revert back to the lower end of this range. Or if the price action gets really impulsive after that pin bar, it could be saying, hey, we could be starting a completely new trend here. It also could be a with trend pin bar trap. So maybe we have an uptrend in play, we have a flag pattern, and then the market creates a little pin bar trap at the bottom there. That could be saying, hey, this is now the start of a new uptrend. We're going to now break out of this and we're going to start to make new highs. So it just depends upon the nature of it. There's, there's so many moving parts to that. There's no way I can give you one particular answer as to how long price will stay in that SR zone. 
it's too many moving parts and it also depends on the type of pin bar trap we're talking about here. Trying Cherry says, as price moves away from the EMA, is that a signal that price could come back? You know what? That's a great SIGU, but shoot, I don't know if I kept that data in here. Darn, I don't think I kept the data. Yes, it can be, depending upon how far price gets away from the 20 EMA. <clears throat> We've done quantitative analysis on, I mean, I have an algorithm which basically I can plug it into any pair, any time frame, and it can tell me over the last 10 years, well, from one hour and above over the last 10 years, anything under one hour can go about three, five years back. But it can say on a one hour time frame, sterling dollar has had a max amount of consecutive candles above or below the 20 MA before it reverted back to it. And it can even tell me the max amount of pips distance from that particular price to the 20 MA before it reverted back. And it's different for each pair. You know, Aussie and Kiwi tend not to get too far away from the 20 EMA because there's not massive volatility involved in them. They tend to be just steady, consistent moves. Sterling dollar can get quite impulsive. Sterling yen can get quite impulsive. They can get much greater distances from the 20 EMA before they're going to snap back. So, yes, that can be a signal if you do get into those more stratospheric levels. But just the price getting away from it doesn't mean it's going to. A great case in point was the yen, the yen pairs as of late on the daily time frame. Many of them were floating above and just they just seemed to levitate above it. Dollar yen during that uptrend was just levitating above it. Sterling yen couldn't even touch it. Look at, I think your yen had some pullbacks. Maybe, maybe not. It had a couple pullbacks. But then look at dollar yen. Dollar yen for the longest period of time just levitated above it. So being away from it doesn't necessarily necessitate that it's going to pull back. Usually when it will pull back is when you see that exhaustion or climax. So hopefully that answers your question. All right, shoot, man, we are running out of time and I got so much information to cover here. Before I move on to the next section, Maud, this webinar is supposed to be an hour and a half, then there's a 30-minute break for the next one. Can I use some of that 30-minute break, maybe an extra 10 minutes, for this portion of the webinar? Because the next one's premium, so and not everybody's going to be in that. It's up to you guys. This is your monthly webinar. Yes, no? And I'm going to start switching data here. I haven't heard from her yet. They might have left the building. Okay, well, let's just keep going, and then we'll see what they say. All right, so you guys are going to get to vote. Maud's back. Okay, great. So, Maud, in regards to my question, we, yes, we have the second part. The first part's supposed to end in about eight minutes, and there's a 30-minute break. Is there any chance I can use some of that break to continue this one? Like, say, 10 minutes? My bladder is not going to be happy about it. I, I swear to God, I have to go to the loo. But, okay, great. Let's go through it. Well, since I only have about, eight, ten, yeah, I have about 18 to 20 minutes, you guys get to choose what is the next thing we dive into. I have two sets of quantitative data here. I have some quantitative data on volatility, intraday volatility for euro and sterling. And I have some quantitative data on particular price action behaviors, and I'll tell you the list of behaviors, such as the max consecutive bull or bear for euro dollar and pound dollar in a one-hour time frame, max consecutive low below the prior low, max consecutive high above the prior high, max consecutive days the range is half the average or twice the average. So that's the, some of the price action analytics. Or I have intraday volatility data. So it's your choice, whichever one gets the first Gets the five votes the fastest, win. Okay, so we're going to one, one, two, two, three, four. Somebody, okay. It's hard to say. I think it was a neck and neck tie between price action and volatility. All right, we'll just race through it as much as we can. I think price action won. 
Let me know if you can see the Excel sheet here. The good thing is this is recorded, so you can always go back to this and use this as a reference. You know, and again, it's one thing to say, you know, to write in a book and say, hey, when you see 10 candles in a row, it sets up a high probability reversal for a two to one target. It's another thing to actually have the statistical data on that. And I've seen both. So this is your dollar, sterling dollar on one hour time frame. It's going to be different. Five minute, daily, one minute, it's all going to be different. But statistically, the range was on the low end, you would see max consecutive like six, seven, or eight, regardless of the time frame. If we're talking time frames from one to the one minute to the daily, on the low end, you would see max consecutive would be about six or seven. On the high end, the highest I saw was 15. So the market could send 15 bull or bear bars in a row. So that person that was following that 10 candle rule, they would have gotten crushed, completely crushed. Okay, so this is on the one hour time frame for your dollar and pound dollar. And I picked the one hour because I think it's a time frame that you all can use and relate to. So for sterling dollar, the max consecutive one hour bars a row it would have would be eight. And if at that point, that doesn't necessarily mean reversal. It just means at that point, it wasn't able to produce a ninth bar, bull bar in a row. Ironically, for the bear, it was 10. Any guesses as to why the max consecutive bear was 10 and the max consecutive bull was 8? Any ideas? Yes, no? Floyd's is falling. That's kind of rhetorical. Bottoms take longer to form. Good, you're on to something there. Price, price drops faster. Okay, kind of getting there. Across all instruments, all time frames, sell-offs tend to be far more violent than buy-ups. They tend to far much more sharply and faster than bull trends. And so if something is falling really rapidly, a lot of people are going to say, hey, shoot, this is a falling knife. I'm not going to get in front of it. They're going to just say, hey, let's let this thing go and exhaust itself out. Let's see some sort of bottoming before we consider getting into it. So it was kind of interesting that across almost all pairs, the max consecutive bear for the most part tended to be much more, a much larger figure than the max consecutive bulls. That to me was interesting as a whole. So max consecutive low, and we also see this kind of extended here in the next statistic, the max consecutive low is below the prior low. Well, that's very useful to me if I'm shorting it and I'm in a trend to know, hey, you know what? I've had six consecutive lows here where the low is below the prior low. You know, so I'm short and my market, keep, my position keeps gaining as the trend continues on. That's very useful information to me to know, hey, you know, we're not even close to extended, you know, being fully extended. This thing can go much longer. Same thing with max consecutive high is above the prior high. That means that if you're in a bull trend that from candle to candle, if you wait to the end of the candle to get back into it, there's a good chance that as long as you let that thing ride, you know, and we're in one of these moves, this thing can continually produce higher highs, meaning you can continue to lock in more profit. Now, this is something that's interesting, and you're going to find this across all pairs. Max consecutive days range is half the average. So in other words, the, pr the range of, for that price action from top to bottom was half the, the statistical average for that pair. Well, wait a minute. 134 candles. On a, not, a, not an hourly chart, but on a daily chart, max consecutive days, the range is half. That means that the market would be much more in a contractive phase to produce, if the average is 100 pips per day, the range was about 50 pips or whatever it was. That tells us that the market has a much greater propensity for being in a consolidation or not producing immense amount of volatility 
when the counter to that statistic is max consecutive days, the range is twice the average? Five. What does that tell you? It tells you everything we've been talking about. Trends or markets can only hold strong pushes for so long. They can only hold it for so long. So a exhaustive phase or a climax phase more than likely is not going to make it to more than three, four, or five candles in a row, bull or bear, that are larger than the daily range, twice the size of the daily range. They're going to have to contract. It can only sustain that for so long, but the market can sustain for a long period of time contracted smaller candles. This all points to that whole exhaustion thing I was talking about. Eventually, it's going to overheat. Does that make sense? Yes, no? Jose says, what? <laughs> okay. If you remember what I was talking about with exhaustion-type moves, exhaustion moves tend to be very large candles that are much bigger than the norm, and the markets can only sustain them for so long. Eventually, it's going to overheat. You can't sustain that kind of imbalance, buying or selling in the market without there being a redistribution or reversal. And what is interesting is that across the board, sterling dollar could only, on a max, have five days in a row where the price action was twice the average, the day's range was twice the average than it normally is. Two times. Only five days in a row. But yet, on the other side of it, it could very easily, for long periods of time, have daily ranges that are half the average. So it tells us it's easier to have much smaller candles and not produce massive price action than it is to produce very large bars. So what does that mean? It means that it, it kind of complements that whole exhaustion thing I was saying. When you start to see the market is incredibly large candles, much larger than the usual, twice the average of the, whatever the volatility range is for that level, it can only sustain it for so long before the market should be reversing or reconsolidating. Does that make sense? Yes, no? Okay, got it. Okay, so that is some of the price action data there, and that's some of the points I wanted to highlight about that. I want to get into the volatility data. Here's the thing. If I don't go to the loo right now, my body is going to demain me. My bladder is going to demain me. So here's what I'm thinking of doing. I'm going to put the volatility data up, Tell me you can see the numbers, the different hours, two different graphs. Can you guys see that? Here's my plan. Let's get uh, into the volatility data here real briefly. I wish I could have more time to explain this. I'll explain it a lot more in my book. And I'll get into it in my book, and you'll see much deeper <coughs> explanation of it in my book. But for now, let me go into it. So this is what we're looking at is the year U.S. dollar. And we're looking at the 2011. Uh-oh. Vicky's saying it must finish in three to five minutes because the premium starts in 15, 25 minutes. Okay, five minutes. I'm going to run through this. So let me explain this. 2011 chart of volatility. 2012 is very similar. It, it's not enough data for me to really bring it out. But here's what we're looking at. This is uh, based on European time. So hour zero, European time, represents the actual New Zealand Open and Sydney Open. Red is the Tokyo Open. And here's where London starts, hour 10, right? Now, take a look at the pattern. You're seeing average range in pips here. Take a look at the pattern. We all kind of understand this intuitively, but... We can now see it numerically, what it looks like. New Zealand and Sydney, not much range, 20 pips from top to bottom as a whole. But we start to see the price start to accelerate toward the later hours of Tokyo. That's because Europeans are coming in. They're starting to build some of it. 
right around here, here, and here is when the Europeans start to get on board, and that's when it starts to increase dramatically. When the Europeans do fully come in the European Open, we get a $7 jump. That's a 25% jump in volatility. By the time the London opens, we have one of our highest hours, but not our highest. Our highest is when New York and London overlap. Now, this is what this looks like graphically. Okay? This is what it looks like graphically. Starts off really slow, builds, we get a little bit of consolidation, we get one more spike, and then it falls off a cliff. How is this useful to us? Well, let's take a look at this for a second. Let's say you're trading on a one hour time frame and you have a target that is 80 pips, but you have the explicit desire to be out of the trade in one hour. We can look at this and say, well, wait a minute, you want 80 pips, the average range in pips from top to bottom for a one hour candle is 45. So it's a little unrealistic now, isn't it? So if you're planning on only being in this trade an hour, you now need to adjust your target based on what you can expect average volatility to be. Now, what does this standard deviation mean in relationship to that? What this means is we calculate it based on two standard deviations. What would it be above and below? The, the data is normalized. So if the average range in pips is 45.5 pips, that means on an average hourly candle, the range from price action on the euro US dollar from the London where the New York starts to open is 45 pips. So we can expect the candle to be anywhere from 45 pips big to the top or the downside. Now there's a deviation in that. Two deviations is 25 pips. Now if you understand deviations and how that works, two standard deviations or two sigma contains about 95% of the data. So about 95% of the time, the market will not extend more than 45 plus 25, AKA 80 pips or 70 pips, or 95% of the time, it won't be smaller than 20 pips. So if we see a one hour candle that's larger than 70 pips or smaller than 20, we are now in something that only occurs 5% of the time. And it either means extreme exhaustion or something unique came into it, maybe central bank intervention or whatever, and this thing's likely to either have a massive reversal or massive continuation at that point. One sigma data, which is more towards the middle, 65% of the time would be half this. So about 65% of the time, we can expect the one hour candles to have a range of 45 plus 12, 57 pips, or 45 minus 12, 33 pips. So this is some of the volatility data. Look what happens once the London session closes. We see a massive fall off in the volatility at that. We all kind of know this intuitively, but imagine knowing, hey, you know what? I just entered the London just closed, and I have a 45 pip target, and the average range is only 28 pips. Maybe that target is a little unreasonable for me to expect to get within one hour. Maybe I need to wait at least two hours for that. So on a tertiary, on a surface level, this is just the beginning of it. We haven't even begun to dive into this. But can everybody see on a surface level how this can be useful? Picking targets, is a move over extended? You know, how many, how long should we expect to be in this trade? Does that all make sense? Yes, no? Useful, not useful? Trader says normal Wertelung. I think that's German. And I don't speak German. Okay, great. Fantastic. With that being said, I need to end this right now because we need about 20 minutes to prepare for the next webinar. Plus, I need some time to prepare for the next webinar. And so, with that being said, I want to thank you all very much for coming. I hope some of you are premium members and you will be in the next leg of this. That would be fantastic. If not, this webinar is recorded, so come back to it again and again and again. Hopefully, you found this data useful. Hopefully, you found this webinar useful. If you have any questions about what we do, check me out, secondskiesforex.com. And so until then, for those of you that I won't be seeing in the next session of this webinar, I bid you all adieu. I wish you good luck trading, and I'll see you guys next week, next Tuesday, for my normal price action class. Take care, everyone.